Hello, well, today I'm going to read the second and final part of chapter two of my book, uh, The Diaries and Letters of Sir Ernest Mason Sato, a scholar diplomat in East Asia. Okay, so um, we'll just pick up from where we left off last time, um, which was page 64. Um, and uh, it was talking about ruses of the desperate to get past the barrier at uh, Hakone uh, by posing as a corpse. <clears throat> Next section is Sato and Wergman. On the 2nd of April, Sato went with his friend Charles Wergman, uh, 1832 to 1891, the artist and editor of Japan Punch, the frivolous chronicle of life in Yokohama, to Manse, the eating house which supplied Sato and Mitford with victuals. They were waited on by beautiful and virtuous damsels, that part in quotation marks. Um, Vergman, who had arrived in Japan in 1861 as special correspondent of the Illustrated London News, was a mediator between the foreign community, especially diplomats and Japanese artists. He was an inveterate companion of the young Sato from his arrival. During a later posting to Uruguay in 1891, Sato thought it worth mentioning in his diary that he had been visited by the younger brother of my old friend Charles, nine months after Vergman's death. Sato and Vergman were on such good terms that they went to a brothel in the Shinagawa area of Tokyo together in April 1867. In March 1872, they went to a shogakai, shogakai an art exhibition at the equivalent of a commercial gallery in which painting and poetry scrolls were for sale and at which some artists did rapid compositions together in a convivial atmosphere. Wergman had already illustrated such a meeting in the Illustrated London News in January 1866. On returning to Edo, Sato also spent time with Mitford at Monryuin, uh, the little temple where they were living, helping him to learn Japanese. Midford was making rapid progress thanks to his tireless effort. Sato began to compile a series of sentences and dialogues for Midford, which were published some years later under the title of Kwaiwa Hen, Conversation Manual. Sato also noted that it was convenient to be outside the legation compound because he could receive visits from the retainers of Daimyo without obstruction. Towards the middle of April, 1867, the foreign diplomatic representatives moved together down to Osaka. Sir Harry was accompanied by Lady Parks, a military escort and the staff, Sidney Lowcock, Secretary of Legation, Mitford, Second Secretary, Sato, Acting Japanese Secretary, Willis and Aston, uh, William George Aston. Charles Wergman was also in the party, much to the jealousy of uh, Rickaby of the Japan Times. The legation was lodged in Teramachi, Temple Town. Sato was kept very busy, on one occasion talking Japanese for 11 successive hours. Much of the negotiations concerned regulations under which settlements were to be found, sorry, formed in Hyogo and Osaka, the conditions for the leasing of land to foreigners and the creation of a municipality in each place. Negotiations proceeded much more smoothly than before as the Japanese ministers took a conciliatory line and Parks had no reason to become angry. The formal interviews with the shogun also went off without a hitch and negotiations were wound up in the middle of May. Overland from Osaka to Edo. On the 18th of May, Sato set off with workmen from Osaka in palanquins, Kago, to travel the Tokaido highway up to Edo. They were escorted by 10 picked men of the legation guard. Sato's servant, Noguchi Tomizo, and two officials belonging to the Jap Japanese Foreign Department, charged with arranging accommodation. The, chip, the trip was planned to take 16 days, with Willis accompanying them as far as Fushimi near Kyoto, where he would join Parks' party bound for Tsuruga on the Japan sea coast in present-day Fukui Prefecture. The trip is described in great detail in Diplomat, uh, a diplomat in Japan, chapter 18. Wergman, whose curious attire gave rise to a grave discussion as to whether he was European or Chinese, uh, that's in quotation marks, 
um, sketched and presented the results to innkeepers, sometimes of himself and Sato on the road or some local scenery or a pretty girl. The supposed high rank of the travelers caused people to kneel down by the roadside as the palanquins passed. The most noteworthy incident occurred on the night of 27th of May. Sato was woken at a quarter past one. A high official of the emperor known as the Rei Heishi was on his way back from a mission to the tomb of Ieyasu at Nikko. He ordered an attack on the foreigners at the inn, which was foiled by the watchful Noguchi. After a two day standoff in which negotiations proceeded to the advantage of Sato and Vergman, the Rei Heishi was permitted by Sato to depart, much to the delight of the local townsfolk who hailed the victory of the foreigners over the unpopular official. The rest of the journey passed uneventfully. Finally, Sato received a letter from Parks urging him to hurry back for important negotiations. In Diplomat, Sato records his irritation that the important conference turned out to be a mere complimentary visit of officials for whom anyone could easily have interpreted. Niigata. On the 23rd of July, 1867, Parks left Yokohama for Niigata to investigate its suitability as a port for foreign trade. He was accompanied by Mitford and Sato. The latter had with him Ono Segoro, one of the legation writers, and his trusted servant Noguchi. Traveling via Hakodate, the party reached Niigata on the 2nd of August. Meetings were arranged with the governor, Shiraishi Shimosa no Kami, who 12 years later was to teach Sato the interpretation of plays in Tokyo. Parks behaved in an undignified fashion, scrambling to the top of a large shed to get a better view of the surrounding countryside. This was to the horror of Mitford and Sato, who longed to see their chief conduct himself with the impassive dignity of a Japanese gentleman. From Niigata, the party proceeded by way of Sado to Nanao, which was discussed as a possible alternative port to Niigata. Then Parks decided to send Mitford and Sato overland to Osaka, while he went to Nagasaki in the Basilisk, HMS Basilisk. This was much to the delight of the young men as they would have a chance to travel in a part of the interior, in, interior quite unexplored by foreigners. Now now to Osaka. Sato and Mitford traveled in two finely decorated palanquins. Ordinary ones were provided for Noguchi and Mitford's Chinese servant, the philosophic Lin Fu. A guard of 22 sworded men carrying long staves completed the party. Sato records his exhilaration in diplomat. They were free away from Parks's stern gaze or the prying eyes of the Shogun's officials or any other Europeans. They were embarked on an adventure, the outcome of which was by no means certain, but which no foreigners had experienced before. Resting at frequent intervals, the party traveled by way of Kanazawa, where delicious melons and apples were served with frozen snow from the mountains behind the town, the predecessor of ice candy. The treatment was that accorded to officials of high rank. However, in the territory of Echizen, now Fukui Prefecture, very little courtesy was shown to the travelers. Sato believed that the reason for this was that the head of the Echizen clan was closely allied with the tycoon, the shogun, and he was probably acquainted with the policy of the British legation as supposed to be set forth in his pamphlet entitled A Kokusakaron, about which we have talked in the previous reading. On reaching Kusatsu by the southern shores of Lake Biwa, Mitford and Sato declared their wish to travel the shortest route through Otsu. This was discouraged by Japanese officials who justifiably feared a fatal confrontation with the anti-foreign party which was in fact preparing an ambush. It was fortunate that eventually the party reached Osaka by way of Uji. On the 26th of August, Sato and Mitford re rejoined parks in Osaka. Uji is to the south of Kyoto. Um, okay. Osaka and Tokushima. On arrival in Osaka, Sato learned of the murder of two sailors of HMS Ikarus at Nagasaki as they were lying in a drunken sleep on the roadway in a low quarter of the town. The rumor at Nagasaki was that the perpetrators were men of the Tosa clan. After an audience with the Shogun, Parks dispatched Sato to Tokushima to find out what sort of reception he might expect. 
the Awa clan of Tokushima were friendly and a banquet was organized for the legation. From here, the party proceeded in the basilisk to Tosa. Tosa and Nagasaki. On the 3rd of September, the ship anchored outside the little harbor of Susaki on the south coast of Shikoku. Parks was sure that the Tosa men were guilty of the murders and some stormy interviews ensued, much to Sato's dissatisfaction. He was rather sick of being made the intermediary of the overbearing language to which his boss continually resorted. Three days later, Parks gave Sato detailed written instructions to go to Nagasaki and watch the proceedings and stimulate both the tycoon's officials and the Tosa people to leave no stone unturned, this is in quotation marks, in their search for the murderers. Traveling via Shimonoseki, Sato reached Nagasaki on the 12th of September. Here he met up with Ito once more. Very little progress was made with the investigations. Sato felt this was natural enough, seeing that the Tosa people were entirely innocent of any share in the murders, as was afterwards proved. On the 12th of October, Sato left Nagasaki in the Coquette, uh, HMS Coquette, bound for Yokohama, arriving there at midnight on the 16th of October. A change of lodging. In July 1867, before leaving Edo, Sato had leased a house known as Takayashiki, High Mansion, on a bluff overlooking the bay. It was the retirement home of a Japanese gentleman of rank, and so it was one of the oddest houses imaginable. This is in quotation marks. There was an upper story where Sato had his bedroom and apartments for the entertainment of Japanese guests, and three staircases provided means of escape in case of an unwelcome visit from the midnight murderer, again in quotation marks. Downstairs, there was a, a room for the reception of European visitors, two waiting rooms for callers, one for the accommodation of Sato's head man, that was Noguchi, and Sato's study. The study was nine feet square with a circular window commanding a view of the sea and a square one at the side overlooking the garden. It was fitted up with numerous small cupboards and shelves for the accommodation of books and papers. All this in quotation marks. King Gardner that he was, especially in his retirement when the second part of Diplomat was written, Sato commented on the garden. It was, in quotation marks, laid out in little hills and glass, grass plots, planted with trees and shrubs. The only flowers were those of the camellia and St. John's wort bushes, Hypericum chinense, for herbaceous borders are almost impossible to manage in Japan, owing to the heavy summer rains, which beat down all the plants that have not woody stems. In this house, Sato was perfectly content. He was established as a householder after his own liking, able to devote himself to Japanese studies and to live intimately with Japanese and thus become acquainted with their thoughts and views. He planned to teach English to young Japanese who would be lodged in a nearby two-story building with Noguchi. Japanese food was delivered from Mansei, but he continued to drink English beer. Downfall of the Shogunate. On the 16th of November, in the dead of night, Ishikawa Kawachi no Kami, one of the Gaikoku Bugyo, commissioners for foreign affairs, came to tell Sir Harry Parks that the shogun had resigned the direction of government into the hands of the emperor and in future would simply be the instrument for carrying out his majesty's orders. On the 30th of November, Sato and Mitford in their capacity as quotation marks, diplomatic stormy petrels, the phrase used by Mitford in his memoirs, sailed in HMS Rattler for Osaka with the mission of finding quarters for the legation. A stormy petrol in mid 19th century meant a person who delights in conflict or whose appearance on the scene heralds trouble. There was indeed soon to be trouble of various kinds. After selecting a suitable residence and arranging for its repair, Sato and Mitford visited the site of the intended foreign settlement. On the 12th of December, they started for Hyogo, um, later Kobe, returning to Osaka the next day. The entry in Sato's diary for 13th of December reads, site of settlement splendid, foolish and Parksian idea of a public garden, much calculated to increase his popularity. On the next day, a friend from the Satsuma clan, Yoshi Kosuke, visited Sato and Mitford in Osaka. He told them that the coalition, 
and this is in quotation marks, which was determined to push matters to the last extremity in order to gain their points, consisted of Satsuma, Tosa, Uajima, Choshu, and Geishu, now Hiroshima. Higo, now Kumamoto Prefecture in Kyushu, and Arima, now in Hyogo Prefecture, were inclined to join Hizen, now Saga Prefecture in Kyushu, and Chikuzen, now part of Fukuoka Prefecture in Kyushu, indifferent. Um, on the whole, it might safely be said that all the Western clans were pretty much in agreement, this part in quotation marks. Sato, for his part, took the opportunity to say that the issue of the murder of the British sailors at Nagasaki was by no means settled, and that one of the first demands to be laid before the new government would be for punishment of the murderers, that no monetary co compensation would be accepted, and that the Japanese, if they wished to remain on good terms with foreigners and to avoid a disaster, had better prevent any recurrence of such incidents. Parks arrived on Christmas Eve. In his diary, Sato recorded, Chief arrived, looked at the house and ran away again. In Diplomat, the record is rather more discreet. Sir Harry arrived on December the 24th, took a look at the legation quarters, and then went back to the ship that had brought him down. There was much talk of the Nagasaki murders. Sato noted that the Foreign Office had written approving Sir Harry's action, and he seemed inclined to keep this question hanging over the Shogun's government as a perpetual nightmare. Parks told them in the strongest language that the British would never desist from pressing the matter until the murderers were seized and punished. Promotion for Sato. On the 31st of December, 1867, dispatches arrived from the Foreign Office sanctioning Sato's appointment as Japanese secretary in succession to Richard Usden. Remember, he'd been assistant Japanese secretary before this. Uh, Richard Usden, who was to be transferred to Hakodate as consul. In his diary, no, Sato noted the arrival of the letter about the new appointments. I am to be Japanese secretary with 700 pounds a year, so there is no need for my kicking up a row or cutting the service as I had thought of doing. Yet on the 24th of January, 1868, we find in Sato's diary that he is indeed kicking up a row. On the 21st of January, F. Maibara, M-Y-B-U-R-G-H, uh, the British consul at Hyogo died after only three weeks in the post. Three days later, Parks appointed the vice consul John F. Lauder, L-O-W-D-E-R, as acting consul at Hyogo. Sato immediately went to Parks and asked whether Lauder was there for his senior. Parks replied that it was usual to appoint the man on the spot to take charge. Sato said that he hoped that the permanent appointment was not affected as he believed he had a prior claim. Parks denied this and then tried to convince Sato that he was better off as Japanese secretary than as a consul on £800 a year at a small port. Sato would not accept this, so Parks told him to put his arguments in writing for him to forward to the Foreign Office. Mitford helped Sato to draft the letter, which read as follows, and this is uh, from uh, Sato's diary. It's written there. In accordance with your desire expressed this morning, this is addressed to Sir Harry Parks. In accordance with your desire expressed this morning to be furnished in writing with the reasons for which I wish to apply for the present vacancy in the list of consuls, I have the honor to lay before you the following considerations. Having been appointed by uh, Her Majesty's Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs to the post of Japanese secretary, so soon as it shall become vacant by the promotion of Mr. Usden to a consulate, that's used in E-U-S-D-E-N. I believe that I am next junior to that official in the Japan consular establishment and consequently senior to all other officers under the rank of consul. You were good enough to express to me your opinion that the Japanese secretaryship is more advantageous uh, post to fill, is a, is a more advantageous post to fill than a consulship at a small port. And that if I were passed over on the present occasion, it would be a proof that the rank was at least equal, thus placing me on a par with those of junior consuls. I would beg to observe, however, that the appointment of Mr. Usden to the consulship at Hakodate is a proof that the Japanese secretary ranks below a consul of a small port. Further, a consul holds the Queen's commission, whereas the Japanese secretary holding no commission occupies an undefined place in HM legation, Her Majesty's legation. 
The Japanese secretaryship then being a junior appointment in the consular service, it can hardly be supposed that any officer would wish to hold that post permanently instead of aspiring to the higher and more responsible one of consul. With regard to the parity of the claims to promotion of the Japanese secretary and those of the junior consuls, I cannot help feeling uh, that the latter from their experience of the business of a consulate might not unreasonably be considered as better fitted for the direction of a large port than an officer whose whole time must necessarily be given up to performing the functions of a translator interpreter. It is for these reasons that I would respectfully submit my claims to be promoted to the vacant consulship in preference to my juniors in the service. Parks did not receive the protest letter favorably. He tried to scare Sato by saying that the Foreign Office might altogether refuse to define his position or else promote him to Hyogo and yet put his successor as Japanese secretary over his head at a big consulate some day. That did not frighten Sato, so then Parks told him he must take precedence after Yuzden forever. Sato answered that he would willingly do so. Then he tried to make Sato believe that he would be entirely shelved if he went to a consulate. Sato did not believe it. On the following day, 25th of January, 1868, matters were still simmering. Parks sent Lokok to see Sato privately, Lokok, L-O-C-O-C-K. Sato dug in his heels. I wouldn't budge. I still considered it my interest. Willis went to him in the evening to talk about his having been passed over and told the chief that if he, Willis, had been made acting consul at Hyogo, my opposition would have been much less and advised him, as it seems, in a rather paternal way, to delay writing about it for a mail or so. Since then, we have heard no more. Evidently, he wants for some reason or other to promote louder very fast, and he wishes to keep me at the legation forever to be his translator. He evidently had the opinion that I would always be content with that position. I was up to the 24th, but he should not try to put a junior like Lauda over me. Well, perhaps Parks's real thinking was that Sato was the best linguist and he just wanted him to stay at the legation to be translator interpreter, uh, regardless of uh, the effect on Sato's promotion. Anyway, uh, young Sato, still only 24 years old at this time, clearly had a burning desire to be promoted as fast as possible and did not want his facility in the Japanese language to become an excuse for holding him back or denying him the consular experience necessary for promotion. Hostilities begin at Fushimi. On the 27th of January, 1868, a great fire was seen in the direction of Kyoto. It was at Fushimi, three miles from the capital and signaled the start of the Boshin Civil War, the series of battles which led to the overthrow of the Tokugawa Shogunate and the restoration of imperial rule. Fushimi was in fact south of, of Kyoto, is south of Kyoto. The ex-shogun's troops were fighting with Satsuma and his allies. On the nearer side of Fushimi, the Shinsen Gumi, a band of two-sworded loyalists originally commissioned in 1863 to counter anti-shogunate activities in Kyoto, were waiting with large bodies of infantry for the battle. On the morning of the 30th, it was clear that the Tokugawa troops were losing the battle. Parks consulted with the legation staff, and it was decided to hire boats to carry the archives to the British squadron anchored off Osaka. At 4 a.m. on the 31st, Lokok woke Sato with the news that the enemy was approaching the city and they should evacuate at dawn. Five boats arrived, and at 10 a.m. the main party set off for the foreign settlement. Sato stayed behind to procure boats for his own baggage and left at noon. At 9 a.m. on the 1st of February, Sato went with Lokok and an escort to the castle, that's Osaka Castle. They discovered a great crowd there, but Tokugawa Keiki, the ex-shogun, had departed. He's also Tokugawa Yoshinobu, he had two names, alternatives, alternative readings of the same name, in fact. After lunch, Parks, Willis and Sato went to the foreign settlement at Tempozan. Willis went to attend to the wounds of some Aizu men who had fought against the imperialists. The next day, Parks went to Hyogo. Sato followed him there reluctantly under orders, for although Osaka Castle was burning, he felt the foreign settlement was under no threat, either of being attacked by the victors or from the burning of the castle. 
he had received repeated assurances from Satsuma, Tosa and Choshu that the, that the legation would be respected. The Bizen affair, probably better known as the Kobe incident in modern times at least, uh, is, but the Bizen affair is what it's called in diplomat in Japan. In Sato's memoirs, the impression is given, especially by the use of the phrase mortal chastisement, that a foreigner was killed in the Bizen, Bizen affair, also known as the Kobe incident. Uh, Sakata Seiichi, the translator of the memoirs into Japanese for Iwanami Bunko, first edition 1960, certainly took this to be the meaning of the following words. On February the 4th, Bizen troops were passing through Kobe from the early morning, and about two o'clock in the afternoon, the retinue of one of their karo, that's a hereditary councillor, shot an American sailor who had crossed the street just in front, which according to Japanese ideas was an incident, was an insult, beg your pardon, that deserved mortal chastisement. After that, they attempted the life of every foreigner whom they met, but fortunately without any serious results. However, while there are several versions of what happened in the Bizen affair, no other account allows the interpretation that anyone was killed. In this, Sato's version stands alone and seems to be incorrect or at best ambiguous. Hmm. Well, I don't know about that. I might wish to revise that thought. Um, I'm not sure that Sato is in fact saying that uh, a foreigner was Oh, yes, they attempted the life of every foreigner they met. Okay. Um, but nobody was actually killed, even in Sato's account. Um, okay. Anyway, the immediate results of the affair were that the settlement was put an alert, on alert, and steamers in the bay were seized. Parks was indignant and had an excuse to complain that no communications had come from the new government. Then on 8th of February, Higashi Kuze Michitome, Michitomi, I'm sorry, 1833 to 1912, the one pro-foreign court noble presented to the foreign representatives a note from the emperor announcing that he would henceforward exercise supreme authority in all the internal and external affairs of the country. The title of emperor was to be substituted for that of tycoon in all treaties concluded so far. This was the first communication by the new emperor to the foreign representatives and arose directly out of the Bizen affair. The next day, reparation was demanded of Higashi Kuze by the representatives, a full apology and capital punishment of the officer who gave the order to fire. On the 12th of February, this was agreed to. It finally took place on the 2nd of March after Parks had argued unsuccessfully with the other representatives for clemency. The ritual suicide or harakiri uh, was witnessed by Sato and Mitford under the orders of Parks. Both have left detailed accounts in their memoirs. First visit to Kyoto. On the 16th of February, the legation staff set out for Kyoto. Parks was in a good mood. Sato recorded gratefully in his memoirs that there were no more interviews with Japanese officials at which he used strong language. Interpreting became a labor of love instead of a painful duty. The departure of his French rival, Monsieur Roche, Monsieur Leon Roche, R-O-C-H-E-S, who had left in a huff after the shogun resigned his office, made Parks the doyen of the diplomatic body and the rest of his colleagues followed his lead, in quotation marks, with perfect unanimity for they had begun to see that his policy was the right one to adopt. It was Parks's influence that induced his colleagues to, indu to join him in issuing declarations of neutrality in the conflict between the emperor and the shogun, which among other things prevented the delivery to the latter of the American ironclad ram Stonewall Jackson bought with Japanese money. After noting the total destruction of Osaka Castle and the temporary legation buildings, on the next day, the party proceeded to Fushimi, arriving there at midnight. On the following morning, they entered Kyoto. At one o'clock, they arrived at So Kokuji, a Buddhist temple near the Imperial Palace, where they met Shiuri no Taiyu of Satsuma and his advisor Saigo. In the afternoon, Willis went to look after the wounded, 
while Sato visited the bookshops in San Giordol. He was unimpressed by Nijo Castle, which struck him as insignificant compared with many fortresses belonging to lowly Fudai Daimyo. On the next two days, Sato discussed the Bizen affair, the Kobe incident, with Saigo, Goto, Shojiro, Willis, and Katsura, uh, Kido Koen. You know, Katsura was Kido Koen. Koen. Uh, Willis maintained that the best way to prevent such incidents was to keep foreign rowdies and Japanese bullies apart by having a separate route for daimyo's processions in the north part of Kobe away from the settlement. Sato and Katsura disagreed. They felt that a change of road would give rise to a great deal more ill will between the opposite nationalities than the murder of a few foreigners, and that a little fighting, in quotation marks, would open the eyes of the Japanese and make them all better friends than before. Finally, on the 23rd of February, Sato returned to Hyogo. Ritual suicide. On the 1st of March, 1868, Sato was asked his opinion by Parks about the advisability of a reprieve in the Bizen affair after learning that the responsible officer would be decapitated. Sato and Mitford had previously agreed that lenience would be a mistake uh, and Sato stood by that view in reply to Parks who favored mercy and was not persuaded by the views of Mitford and Sato. Why did Sato and Mitford adopt a hard line? It may be that the unresolved issue of the Icarus murders in Nagasaki was on their minds and they felt it was essential to make an example of a Japanese to deter any further attacks on foreigners. If one remembers the catalog of attacks going back over a decade, they indeed had a point especially as a new regime was taking power. However, it is hard to escape the conclusion that in this particular case, the Bizen officer, Taki Zenzaburo by name, was harshly, if not unjustly treated. No foreigner died in this affair or incident. <clears throat> in any case, having unsuccessfully argued for clemency, Parks was in no mood to watch the judicial harakiri or seppuku and ordered Sato and Mitford to observe it. They duly attended the ritual at Seifukuji Temple in Hyogo on the evening of the 2nd of March. Uh, that temple no longer exists. It, it's on, but it's, uh, there is a new temple uh, which includes the grounds of the old temple. The word harakiri, written with the Chinese characters for abdomen and cutting, is better known in the Western world than the more formal term seppuku, which is written with the same characters in the reverse order. The abdomen, hara, was chosen as the target of the suicidal knife because the ancient Japanese regarded it as the place where the soul resides and the source of action-derived tension. Additionally, the abdomen came to be regarded as the cradle of the individual's will, boldness, spirit, anger, and generosity. By the time of the Edo period, 1600 to 1868, seppuku had become one of the five grades of punishment for wrongdoers among the samurai class. All aspects of the ritual were prescribed with precision. Apparel, sight, time, witnesses, inspector, and assistant. In the Meiji period, 1868 to 1912, nationalism and the partial reversion to traditional values combined to keep the practice alive. The most famous instance was that of General Nogi Maresuke, who in 1912 chose to follow Emperor Meiji in death. So-called Junshi. <clears throat> Uh, the following is Sato's account of the ritual suicide. After a discussion between the foreign representatives lasting almost three hours, in which Parks and the Dutch minister argued for clemency but were outvoted, at 8.30 p.m. Godai Tomo Atsu and Ito, Hirobumi that is, were called back into the room and informed of the decision. And here we have the quotation, Sato's account. So we started at nine o'clock, Mitford and myself with a single representative of each of the other legations. We were guided to the Buddhist temple of Seifukuji at Hyogo, arriving there at a quarter to 10. Strong guards were posted in the courtyard and in the antechambers. We were shown into a room where we had to squat on the matted floor for about three quarters of an hour. During this interval, we were asked, asked whether we had any questions to put to the condemned man and also for a list of our names. At half past 10, we were conducted into the principal hall of the temple and asked to sit down on the right hand side of the dais in front of the altar. 
Then the seven Japanese witnesses, Ito, Nakashima Sakutaro, two Satsuma captains, and a Bizen Ometsuke took their places. After we had sat uh, quietly thus for about 10 minutes, footsteps were heard approaching along the veranda. The condemned man, a tall Japanese of gentlemanlike bearing and aspect, entered on the left side, accompanied by his kaishaku, or best man, and followed by two others, apparently holding the same office. Uh, Taki Zenzaburo was dressed in the blue kamishimo of hempen cloth. The kaishaku wore, wore surcoats, jimbauri. Ah, yes, there were two kaishaku, okay. Sorry, so they were best men. <clears throat> Coming before the Japanese witnesses, they prostrated themselves, the bow being returned, and then the same ceremony was exchanged with us. Then the condemned man was led to a red sheet of felt cloth laid on the dais before the altar. On this he squatted after performing two bows, one at a distance, the other close to the altar. With the calmest deliberation, he took his seat on the red felt, choosing the position which would afford him the greatest convenience for falling forward. A man dressed in black with a light gray hempen mantle then brought in the dirk wrapped in paper on a small unpainted wooden stand and with a, uh, a bow placed it, sorry, with a bow placed it in front of him. He took it up in both hands, raised it to his forehead and laid it down again with a bow. This is the ordinary Japanese gesture of thankful reception of a gift. Then in a distinct voice, very much broken, not by fear or emotion, but as it seemed reluctant to acknowledge an act of which he was ashamed, declared that he alone was the person who on the 4th of February had outrageously at Kobe ordered fire to be opened on foreigners as they were trying to escape. That for having committed this offense, he was going to rip up his bowels and re requested all present to be witnesses. He next divested himself of his upper garments by withdrawing his arms from the sleeves, the long ends of which he tucked under his legs to prevent his body from falling forward. The body was thus quite naked to below the navel. He then took the dirk in his right hand, grasping it just close to the point, and after stroking down the front of his chest and belly, inserted the point as far down as possible and drew it across to the right side, the position of his clothes still fastened by the girth preventing our seeing the wound. Having done this, he with great deliberation bent his body forward, throwing his head back so as to render the neck a fair object for the sword. The one kaishaku who had accompanied him round the two rows of witnesses to make his bows to them had been crouching on his left hand, a little behind him, with drawn sword poised in the air from the moment the operation commenced. He now sprang up suddenly and delivered a blow, the sound of which was like thunder. The head dropped down onto the matted floor and the body lurching forward fell prostrate over it, the blood from the arteries pouring out and forming a pool. When the blood vessels had spent themselves, all was over. The little wooden stand and the dirk were removed. Ito came forward with a bow, asking had we been witnesses? We replied that we had. He was followed by Nakashima, who also made a bow. A few minutes elapsed and we were asked were we ready to leave. We rose and went out, passing in front of the corpse and through the Japanese witnesses. It was 12 o'clock when we got back to the consulate where we found Sir Harry waiting to receive our report. That's the end of Sato's account in A Diplomat in Japan. I must say, I, it's strange or feels strange to, to me that it, this would have been conducted in a Buddhist temple, but perhaps, perhaps it's not so strange. Uh, comments welcome. Newspaper reports written by Charles Rickaby, the owner and editor of the Japan Times, were most critical of the proceedings and stated that it was disgraceful for Christians to have attended the disgusting execution. Sato responded in characteristic style in his memoirs. He felt proud that he had not shrunk from witnessing a punishment which he had done his best to bring about. Far from being a disgusting exhibition, it was, in quotation marks, a most decent and decorous ceremony. It compared most favorably with the barbarity of the public executions in front of Newgate Prison in London, which were stopped by a private member's bill in 1868. Moreover, he claimed that the Bizen clan accepted the justice of the sentence. Once more, Sato's cool and unemotional demeanor is here revealed. While Parks seems to have been squeamish at the thought of witnessing the spilling of blood, Sato describes it in a clinical fashion as part of a day's work. 
He sees the harakiri with the detached eyes of the ambitious student determined to become a great scholar of Japanese language and culture. Naturally, harakiri is part of Japanese culture, which makes it interesting or rather fascinating to Sato. The same fascination is seen in Things Japanese by Basil Hall Chamberlain and in Mitford's account of the suicide in his Tales of Old Japan. Kyoto, audience of the emperor. In fact, with the emperor is probably better in modern, modern English, but this is Sato said audience, wrote audience of the emperor. On the 19th of March, the whole legation crossed from Kobe to Osaka in HMS Adventure. The next day they rode to Fushimi, arriving at 6 p.m. On the 21st of March, they reached Kyoto and stayed at Chion-in, a very fine Buddhist monastery at the foot of Higashiyama, which can be visited to this day. After a round of visits to Sanjo Sanetomi, Iwakura Tomomi, and other important court officials, the legation was visited by Date and Goto of Tosa, now Kochi Prefecture in Shikoku, on the 22nd of March. They came to discuss arrangements for the audience with the emperor, which was due to take place the following day. Only Mitford would be allowed to accompany Parks as he had been presented at court in England. Sato, who had not been presented at court, would not be allowed at the audience. This seems to have been either snobbery or spite towards Sato on the part of Parks, but as Sato later stated that he did not have the right diplomatic uniform for the occasion, it probably did not concern him much. However, on the 23rd of March, the legation and escort was attacked by two members of the anti-foreign party while proceeding at 1 p.m. from Chion in to the palace for the audience with the emperor. Sato relates the attack in his memoirs. Again, he came close to death and his pony was injured, but he took it in his stride. Mitford was in a palanquin because his mare was lame. The Englishmen in the party numbered about 70. They were followed by a guard of some 2,000 Japanese soldiers. This is a quoting from a diplomat in Japan. The procession was to be headed by the mounted escort led by Inspector Peacock of the Metropolitan Police and Nakai Kozo, then Sahari and Goto Shojiro, myself and Lieutenant Bradshaw, the detachment of the 2nd Battalion of the 9th Regiment, followed by Willis, J.J. Ensley, Mitford in a palanquin being unable to ride, and five naval officers who had come up with us. We descended the whole length of the street called Nawate, opposite to the main gate of Chion In. But just as the last file of the mounted escort turned the corner to the right, a couple of men sprang out from opposite sides of the street, drew their swords and attacked the men and horses, running down the line and hacking wildly. Nakai, observing what was passing, jumped down from his pony. This is Nakai Hiromu, um, the research uh, of... Uh, uh, yeah, anyway, um, sorry, Nakai Hiromu. Uh, and engaged the fellow on the right with whom he had a pretty tough fight. In the struggle, his feet got entangled in his long loose trousers and he fell on his back. His enemy tried to cut off his head, but Nakai parried the blow, receiving only a scalp wound and pierced the man's breast with the point of his sword at the same time. This sickened him and as he was turning his back on Nakai, he received a blow on the shoulder from Goto's sword, which prostrated him on the ground. And Nakai jumped up, hacked off his head. Uh, in the meantime, the troopers on the left had turned and some of them pursued the other villain who rushed down the street from which Sir Harry and I had not yet emerged. Sorry, I was meaning to mention there that my hesitation, I was. I was going to mention that uh, Professor Eleanor Robinson of Kyoto Prefectural University has made a special study of Nakai Hiromu, or as we have him here, Nakai uh, Kozo. <clears throat> Let's continue. Uh, Sato had only just realized what was happening and it was all he could do to turn his pony's head so as to escape the blow which was aimed at him. The pony took the full force of the blow, sustaining a cut nose and a shoulder wound near to Sato's knee. In, again in quotation marks, as soon as I recovered my equanimity, I moved up to the head of the procession. There I saw Sir Harry Parks in his brilliant uniform of an envoy and minister, calmly sitting on his horse in the middle of the crossroads with Inspector Peacock close by, also on horseback and a crowd of Japanese spectators. The Japanese infantry, 300 men of Higo, that's now Kumamoto Prefecture, 
who had led our procession had disappeared, as had also those who had originally brought up the rear. But our Japanese grooms stuck to us with the greatest cool pluck. Behind me was the infantry guard of the 2nd 9th, facing to the left. Upon them he hurled himself, cutting one man over the head and inflicting a severe wound. But here his career came to an end, for one of the soldiers put out his foot and tripped him up, and others drove their bayonets into him. Nevertheless, he managed to get to the end of the line, where being stopped by Mitford's palanquin, he fled into the courtyard of a house, dropping his sword outside. Here he was found by Bradshaw, who discharged a pistol at his head, but the bullet struck the joint of the lower jaw and did not penetrate the bone. On this he fell down in the yard and became nearly insensible. Nine members of the escort and two others were wounded so that the planned audience was abandoned. The party returned to Chionin directly. The wounds were found on examination to be less serious than first thought, but much blood had been lost and the wrist of one man had been almost completely severed. Sato observed in Diplomat in Japan, it was a great piece of good fortune that we had such an experienced surgeon as Willis with us. The captured assailant appeared to be a Buddhist priest, at least his head was shaven. Assisted by a retainer of Sanjo's, we examined him. He expressed great penitence and asked that his head might be cut off and exposed publicly to inform the Japanese nation of his crime. His wounds were attended to by Willis and he was carefully deposited in the guardroom. Nakai brought the head of the other man back with him and kept it by his side in a bucket as a trophy. It was a ghastly sight. On the left side of the skull, a terrible triangular wound exposed the brain, and there was a cut on the right jaw, which apparently had been dealt by the sword of one of the escort. The audience with the emperor was postponed and finally took place three days later on the 26th of March. As had previously been arranged, only Mitford of the legation staff was presented. The emperor expressed his deep regret for the attack. Parks responded that the memory of the attack would be effaced by the gracious reception which your majesty has given me this day. The surviving attacker was executed that morning. Return to Edo and audience at Osaka. On the 31st of March, Sato arrived back in Yokohama and the next day went up to Edo with Noguchi and six Japanese as escort. The van of the imperialist army had already arrived at Edo. Keiki was residing in retirement at the Tokugawa Mausoleum of Ueno. Most of the daimyo had either returned to their territories or gone to Kyoto to pledge allegiance to the emperor. When Saigo called on Parks at Yokohama on the 28th of April, Parks told him that severity towards Keiki or his supporters, especially in the way of personal punishment, would injure the reputation of the new government in the opinion of European powers. Saigo replied that the life of the ex-shogun would not be demanded. He retired to the Shizuoka area, living quietly and modestly until his death in 1913. Sato divided his time between gathering information in Edo and making translations or drawing up reports in Yokohama. Bread and beef were unprocurable in, at Edo, and Sato could not afford to set up cuisine in European fashion. So while there, he used to have his food brought in from a well-reputed Japanese restaurant close by and came to like it quite as well as what he had been accustomed to all his life. On the 15th of May, Parks F.O. Adams, that's Francis Ottowell Adams, successor to Lowcock, J.J. Quinn, that's John James Quinn, the senior student interpreter, and Sato left Yokohama in the Admiral's yacht Salamis bound for Osaka. Two days later, they reached Hyogo at nine in the morning. Their purpose was to present the first letter of a European sovereign to the rightful sovereign of Japan. 22nd of May was fixed as the date of the ceremony. Sato was busy translating the credentials into Japanese and was obliged to attend the audience. This was much to his annoyance for he possessed no diplomatic uniform, as we already know. After being offered a loan of clothes by Parks, he eventually went in plain evening dress. On the appointed day, the legation arrived at Osaka's Nishi Honganji temple for the ceremony at one o'clock. Tea and sweetmeats were served before the party entered the throne room which was an apartment of considerable size, down each side of which there ran a row of wooden pillars supporting the roof. On a dais at the extreme end sat the emperor under a canopy supported by black lacquered poles and with the blinds rolled up as high as possible. 
Parks recited his address, Ito Hirobumi, read Sato's translation and everyone bowed. Parks then stepped forward and handed Queen Victoria's letter to the emperor. Ito read the emperor's response. Then Parks introduced each of his staff, followed by Admiral Keppel, K-E-P-P-E-L, who introduced his officers. The audience was then terminated without mishap. Capture of Wakamatsu and entry of the emperor into Edo. The 6th of November was celebrated with much pomp and ceremony as the emperor's birthday. 10 days later at an interview between Higashi Kuze and Terashima and all the foreign representatives, news came that the castle of Wakamatsu had surrendered on the 6th of November to the imperial forces. Sato noted, uh, now that this exciting episode was at an end, the speedy submission of the other northern clans could be counted on with confidence. On the 21st of November, Sato records that Adams, Mitford, Marshall and Wergman went to the Yoshiwara, the red light district of Edo. He quotes, oh, there is a quotation here uh, again. The admission of Europeans into that quarter of town from which they had until then been jealously shut out was hailed as the dawn of a day of friendly intercourse of the Frankist character. Next evening, I gave a great entertainment at my own house. There were three geisha from Shimme Mai and two taiko mochi uh, jesters. We kept it up boisterously until midnight. Sato himself records visiting the Yoshiwara with Wergman on November the 25th. On the 26th of November, Sato, Wergman, Mitford and Rickaby saw the emperor pass into Edo. In quotation marks, the following. The display could not be described as splendid for the effect of what was oriental in the courtiers costumes was marred by the horribly untidy soldiers with unkempt hair and clothing vilely imitated from the West. Mikado's black lacquered palanquin, Horen, was to us a curious novelty. In December, Willis was busy at Wakamatsu looking after the many Aizu wounded. Sato was occupied with the compilation of his English Japanese dictionary. I think that's the one he did with Ishibashi of the Japanese Foreign Office. News also arrived that the murderers of the two sailors of HMS Icarus, Icarus had been from Chikuzen, now part of Fukuoka Prefecture, not Tosa, which is now Koji, Kochi Prefecture. Sato commented that it was strange that retainers of Chikuzen, who entertained Admiral King so hospitably in January 1867, should have been guilty of such a wanton crime. On the 13th of December, Sato was visited by Nakai Hiromu and noted in his diary that little had changed in the relations between the foreign representatives and the government, despite the restoration. The foreigners were still to be kept at arm's length. Again, this is a quotation. The old distrust still exists. The foreign ministers are a necessary evil to be endured, but not taken to the breast. Nothing pleases the Mikado's government so much as to see the foreign representatives living at Yokohama, and the idea of taking their advice on any point is never entertained for a moment. In fact, the representatives are looked upon in much the same light as the men of the daimyos, i.e. persons sent to Japan by their respective governments to receive the Mikado's orders whenever occasion may arise. The representatives are to blame partly. Fine houses, comfortable living and whole skins at Yokohama are preferable to makeshifts and dangers in Edo. But for all they know or can learn of diplomatic affairs, it might just as well be in Hong Kong. 1869, audience with the emperor at Edo. On the 1st of January, 1869, Edo was open to foreign trade and residence. Willis was installed as Her Majesty's Vice Consul, although he was still involved with medical matters. Sato went back to Edo the next day. On the 5th of January, the British legation had an audience with the emperor. Sato noted wearily that as usual, Parks had mismanaged the business because he insisted on doing it all himself instead of leaving the details to his subordinates. And he did not even know the names of those who were to be presented. The audience took no more than five minutes and was held in the palace of the Nishinomaru, just inside the Sakurada gate of the uh, Imperial Palace. That's the gate where Inasuke was murdered, I think, uh, back in the early 1860s. Sato leaves Japan for home leave. 
On the 14th of February, Sato had a farewell dinner in his honor at Edo. It was attended by Mitford, Siebold, Alexander Siebold, and various Japanese, including Kido, Kido Koin, and the daimyo of Bizen. He left Edo the next day for Yokohama. On the 16th of February, he noted in his diary, Higashi Kuze, that's Higashi Kuze Michitomi, has written me a complimentary letter regretting my departure and presenting me with a big lacquer cabinet as a mark of the Mikado's appreciation. And Kido, Kido Koin or Takahashi, has done the same, asking me to put him up to any wrinkles about Japan which I may learn in Europe and promising to answer any letters I may send him. Uh, I think that's from Sato's diary. <clears throat> yes, indeed it is, as I've just said. Finally, on the 24th of February, Sato sailed from Yokohama in the Peninsula and Oriental steamer, Ottawa. Lady Parks was also on board on her way to England and the English community paid her the compliment of sending out a band which played Home Sweet Home as the anchor was weighed. Sato felt the tears come into his eyes, but he was not sure of the reason. In quotation marks, it would be hard to say whether they were caused by the emotion that a much loved piece of music always produces or by regret at leaving a country where I had lived so happily for six years and a half. That's from Diplomat in Japan. With him, he had his faithful Aizu Samurai, Noguchi Tomizo. Uh, a long time ago, I met a descendant of Noguchi in Hyogo, in Kobe, in fact. Sato traveled to England via Shanghai, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Bombay. On 10th of April, 1869, he reached Aden and eight years, sorry, eight days, <laughs> eight days later, he was in Alexandria. Well, it was slow in those days, but it wasn't quite that slow. From this point, his diary falls silent until the 7th of December of the following year when he was already back in Japan. So that was 7th of December, 1870. He certainly spent some time in Sidmouth at his father's house and he was there celebrating his 26th birthday, 30th of June, 1869, when he received a letter from the Foreign Office dated 28th of June, asking him if he desired to be a candidate for the consulship of Niigata. The letter signed by Sir Edmund Hammond, the permanent Under Secretary for Foreign Affairs, uh, 1854 to 73, uh, stated that if he chose to remain as Japanese secretary, he would be considered to hold rank with, but after consuls, but before vice consuls. Hmm. The Japanese secretaryship was therefore a curious anomaly. It was neither fish nor fowl. How it could be the same rank as a consul and yet between consul and vice consul seems inexplicable. Um, yet such things are apparently not uncommon in the British Foreign Office. Sato's decision had an important bearing on his future career. He replied that he wished to retain his present post. This was just as well as Niigata proved to be totally unsuited to trade. When Sato returned to Japan, he was therefore still Japanese secretary. In A Diplomat in Japan, he wrote that Yusden, his predecessor as Japanese secretary, was, in quotation marks, neither a native of Japan, nor had he any knowledge of the language, so that the title must be understood as signifying secretary in charge of correspondence with the Japanese government. Part of Yusden's salary was intended as remuneration for instructing student interpreters in the language of the country, so it was not earned. Uh, Sato later did his bit in that regard, I think. It was later written with some acerbity that the Japanese secretary was the real motive source of the legation uh, who occupies a position of greater importance than that of the nominal head, but with an irony which is not uncommon in government administration, he is the least appreciated member. Sato continued at that rank with the dig dignity, sorry, with the dignity of second secretary added in 1876, until he left Japan in 1883. And thereafter, he was promoted from the consular service to the diplomatic service. So it worked out for him in the end, uh, despite uh, his not becoming a consul at any point. And so that is the end of the second part of my reading of chapter two and the end of chapter two. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed that. Um, and in due course, I may continue with these readings uh, when I have time. Thank you very much and goodbye for now.